September 16th and received a gratuity for participation. At Electric Ireland, we're all about real commitment. Just like the Saturday sports chaperone who's battled through weather and traffic all season and driven further than a Kerry to Derry bus driver. It's why we keep giving our gas and electricity customers the 8.5% savings they get on day one, no matter how long they're with us. For real commitment, visit electricireland.ie. Electric Ireland. Smarter living. Estimated annual bill €1,736, based on average consumption, urban 24-hour, discounted unit rate, standing charge, PSO levy and carbon tax, residential dual fuel, direct debit and online billing. Terms and conditions apply. See electricireland.ie forward slash EAB. Rates as of 9th of September 2019, subject to change. Tomorrow, it's Man United v Arsenal in one of the league's biggest rivalries. And with Now TV, you can watch all the action live for a one-off payment of just €10. Euro. Hold on, they're checking with VAR. That's confirmed, it's 10 euro. Unbelievable stuff. So to only pay for the games that matter to you, grab a Now TV Sky Sports Day Pass. Search Now TV Sports. 18 plus content streamed via internet, full terms apply. This Irish success story is brought to you by Guaranteed Irish. Did you know that all of the 34 million pots of Suda cream sold in over 50 countries worldwide are manufactured by an Irish pharmaceutical company in Baldoyle, trusted by mums, dads and beauty queens across the globe while also supporting 51 Irish jobs. Guaranteed Irish helps you support companies that are altogether better choices for our communities. So, look out for it. Guaranteedirish.ie. Altogether better. For a limited time, claim up to €150 Euro cash back when you purchase selected NEF home appliances. To find out more, go online to powercity.ie or call in store today. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Now then, you're welcome back. So we are turning to review the Sunday Papers. In studio, we have Sinead O'Carroll, incoming editor of The Journal, and we have Ryle Nugent, commentator, former group head of sport at RTE. You're both very welcome. Hello, Hello. sir. Quiet weekend. Nothing yeah. going on. <laughs> So we will start with the front pages. I was about to start, was it, there's John Delaney and there's the rugby. Well, I'll go with, well, I'll go with whatever I have nearest to hand. So it's the rugby firstly, this is the Sunday Times uh, front page of their sports section. And it's a brilliant picture in fairness of the Japanese team at full time yesterday. They've done it again is the headline. Rugby World Cup host Japan stun Ireland 19 points to 12, four years after beating the mighty Springboks. Uh, it's a really cool picture there. Beneath that, by the way, uh, Mourinho waits for axe to fall on Zidane, so it seems Jose Mourinho is going back to Real Madrid very, very shortly. Uh, frankly, as soon as Florentino Perez can justify sacking Zidane is the story in the front page of the Sunday Times. Elsewhere, front page of the Sunday Times main section, FAI in talks over Delaney exit there. So the Sunday Times uh, certainly knew that things were coming to a close between John Delaney's people and the FAI. Uh, lawyers representing both sides have been holding discussions that could lead to his position being clarified before publication of the first report into financial matters at the association on October 7th. So they've just organised this and put a bow on it before October 7th when the first report is due. The uh, FAI Board of Management, it says here, Paul Rowan, with the piece composed of eight members, FAI Board of Management with eight members, is unanimous, there's no way back for Delaney and that only the terms of his departure would need to be worked out. So that's on the front page of the Sunday Times. The statement duly arrived from the FAI at about quarter past 11 last night. Uh, the Sun, in fairness, I'm not quite sure how, but they had it confirmed. So I don't know if they go to press later or whatever way they work things, but Mark May here. Uh, John gone. FAI confirms Delaney exit. FAI late last night announced the resignation of John Delaney. And they detail the statement from the FAI, which is included then in page four of the Sun. Their back page, uh, obviously the rugby again featuring Japan 19, Ireland 12. Land of the Rising Scrum, Ireland land in deep Schmidt after defeat. <laughs> the sun, which sums it up about right. Front page of the Sunday Independent then for you. Shock to the system, brilliant picture. If you're listening on the radio, it's uh, Connor Murray walking away, realising what's just happened at full time and several Japanese players around him, hands in the air. It is conceivable, if unlikely, that Ireland could still win this pool. Brendan Fanning's piece here beneath the picture. But the psychological damage from this defeat will be significant. That's the Sunday Independent. Back page of the Mirror then. Uh, City Van Heyer, Van Bronckhurst uh, led into Inner Sanctum of Etihad operation as they prepare for life without Pep 2021. Uh, pretty interesting story this. So Giovanni Van Bronckhorst has been given a season pass access all areas. He's 44 years old now. 
to the Etihad. And it seems that the uh, people in charge there have decided he's the man to succeed Pep when Pep goes in 2021. That's if he goes, it's still up in the air what Pep's going to do. But they've given Van Bronckhorst access all areas for the season. He was uh, last managing Feyenoord between 2015 and 19. They won the Dutch title once and the cup twice. So they reckon he's their man. Uh, next then, Sunday World. Back page, uh, Schmidt hits Japan. Pretty good headline there, Schmidt hits Japan. Uh, blunt force trauma was painful sights at Brian O'Driscoll. So Brian O'Driscoll talking about how he felt Ireland were devoid of ideas, looked devoid of energy, they were very blunt. He's going to be on the show later on, just after three o'clock. He was on ITV yesterday. And then the Mail on Sunday, that same picture of Conor Murray walking away at full time. What a slap in the face. Ireland's World Cup plans are in disarray after Japan humiliation. There we are. Let's start with the rugby. We'll get on to John Delaney in a few moments' time. There's not much in the papers in John Delaney, given the circumstances of the uh, press release. There is plenty... Do you want the silver lining? ...of rugby Go on. Go on. It's, there's some really good writing today. Mm. There is some excellent sports journalism in the papers. That is a tiny uh, silver lining. But it's a very, <laughs> very <laughs> tiny <laughs> silver lining. Silver lining. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> As someone who really enjoys good sports writing, um, it's a small silver lining. But yeah, it's um, you woke up this morning again just thinking, oh, the next few weeks were meant to be something. Going into a tournament where Ireland conceivably could do well and that the team would see it as a disappointment if anything happened other than getting to a final. That's a really nice place to be in as a fan. Mm. And then it turns to like, right, we actually have to like decipher this and really go hard and look at it. This is not just about Japan. Like this is not just about a good performance by Japan. And, and that's part of why <coughs> I'm kind of enjoying the papers today is that no one's going soft on on Schmidt or the team like this was as Neil Francis said and I'm not very often in a place where I am nodding my head in agreement with a Neil Francis piece and he said the Irish players are guilty of an unforgivable dereliction of duty you know I I I'm still 24 hours out 24 hours maybe maybe 26 hours later kind of trying to f I still haven't quite figured out the the implication of what happens next, I, it felt and feels like <clears throat> something very different to when other defeats have come before. And, and by that I mean, like, and, and, and Fa Brendan Fanning sums it up perfectly, like the psychological damage for this will be significant. Um, he says, a fourth defeat in 11 tests this year is hardly a historical landmark in the Irish game, but losing to a tier two nation is a shock to the system. It's conceivable, if unlikely, that Ireland could still win the pool without having do to do anything extraordinary over the remaining games. Japan and Scotland between them could open the door, but who, and this is the key for me, and this is why I think there's this sense of darkness this morning about what happened yesterday. Whoever is waiting is now looking at the Irish side and brushing up on their basic, stand up to the Irish set piece, match their intensity, win the game. Mm. And that is the bit. It, it, for me, it, it was so difficult to accept that Ireland got beaten by the better team on the day. They didn't play that badly. Yes, things went wrong and that happens in every game. But that they couldn't figure it out, that they didn't manage to sort it out and that they didn't manage to come away with the win that we all presumed that we were going to, that they were going to do. And, and, and everybody, I don't think anybody saw this coming. People will say, I did say, or I did suggest. Nonsense. Nobody put their hand up and said. And particularly after Scotland. Some, some yeah. people might have said it before. Yes, these, these yes. two games are as important. But once Scotland happened, no one thought that yesterday would happen. No, and, and I, think, I think some very, very good writers and some very, very good columnists, as much as you're admiring the writing this morning, there's been a lot of people kind of in that area blowing in the wind over the last couple of weeks because we've gone from world champs to world chumps pretty, pretty quickly. And I think what it does indicate is actually Ireland weren't necessarily that good last week. Scotland were that bad. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the, and, I, and I think, we'll, go, we'll get to it in a minute, one of, one of the columnists inside, I think it's Eamon Sweeney, talking about, like, like it's the 2019 form line. This, the, 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 the signs for this were in the performance against England and the performance against Wales and the Six Nations, not in the performance against Scotland last week. But I think that's why we're deflated this morning and that's why Conor Murray looked so deflated in all those pictures across the papers is that 
this defeat is so bad because it goes back to what happened against England. It mm. goes back to how we played in the Six Nations. It doesn't feel like an aberration. It feels like, oh, this is where we're at. Like, and, we are... And the follow-on from that is, no matter what happens over the next two to three weeks, come the quarter-final, yeah. be it the box or the blacks, we'll be back here watching the semi-finals, or they'll all be back here yeah. watching the semi-finals on TV again. And you wonder... After all the promise, after all the, and, and you know, you, all the hype, all the, everybody got on board on this thing again. And you, you start to bang your head off the wall and go, like, in, what is it, that quote about insanity being repeating the same thing over and over again and yes. expecting a different outcome. And, and here we are again, we've been down this road. Like, I, I'm old enough to have been in the stadium when Gordon Hamilton scored that try and, and, and everybody was going, Ireland might... That's actually the closest we've got to a damn semi-final since. And we've been through the 2007 scenario where it was going to happen. And we were in 2011 where we got beaten by Wales softly in a, in a quarter-final. And, and here we are again building ourselves up. And I made myself a promise. She said, that's it. I'm done building myself up. And then 2018 was so exciting. Yeah. And then, but I think one of the things with the psychological damage, it's not just the psychological damage to the Ireland side, it's the psychological boost to every other team. So there is absolutely, like I added to that piece um, from Brendan Fanning, I added the words, no doubt at the end of it. Like brush up on your basics, stand up to the Irish set piece, match their intensity, win the game. And there is no doubt. Any team going into play Ireland now they know that they can beat them. There's no seed. It doesn't matter if it's Wales, if it's South Africa, if it's the All Blacks. There's going to be... The All Blacks aren't going to be thinking about those two losses they had in 2018. Not at all. Not at all. Like, Wales aren't going to be thinking about the, the games in the lead-up to this World Cup. And, and They'll and just be thinking, this is Ireland, they're beatable. In we go, right. out we get. And, like, and unless we've got it completely wrong, uh, uh, and when I say we, I'll say, when, unless I've got it completely wrong, this Japanese side is going to get beaten in a quarter-final by either the Box or the Blacks by 40 points if they make it to there. You know you know that's going to happen, and that makes it even harder to, to, to accept. And I, I, I don't know what it says about, about the psyche, but Eamon, Eamon Sweeney uh, in his... Uh, um, and, and, I, and I do like the way Eamon writes, particularly off when he's got to write immediately rather than when he has the week to think about it, and he had to write immediately on this one. All those predictions that Ireland could win the World Cup turn out to have been the sporting equivalent of those late Celtic Tiger extra exhortations to keep buying property because the boom would just get boomier. Hardly anyone saw the crash, that crash coming either. In the, in the stands, Joe Schmidt looked like a man who just heard how his Anglo-Irish bank shares were doing. His players looked like guys who discovered what those Eastern European apartments they'd bought off the plans were really worth. Ireland haven't turned out to be the new All Blacks any more than Bulgaria turned out to be the new Tuscany. <laughs> Great line. Great line. Um, I had the same ones underlined. And it, yeah. like, I think one of the things that stood out from the, the papers for me as well was there was a lot of talk around Joey Carberry kicking to touch in the 80th minute, which I think we all now agree that was the right thing to do, right? Yeah. Like, I think when these were being filed yesterday, there was a few more question marks about whether that was the thing to do or should we have tried to run it out and go the whole length of the field even though we had all just watched the, what had happened the previous 80 minutes um, but th there is some points along the way uh, uh, in the pieces while they all start with that they do start to look at like there were so many signs throughout like we went 12-3 up and then just things started to unravel like just before half time Eamon Sweeney talks about Rory Best, over, Best overthrowing a line out mm. Tyke Furlong knocking the ball forward in a tackle Jack Hardy putting, putting a kick off dead and the Irish scrum disintegrating humiliatingly in the Japanese 22. Mm. Like, that's all before the second half. Like, Joe, do you know what I, wanted, what, I, what I wanted to see yesterday? For the first time, I reached from a player for the past and I wanted to put him into that scenario yesterday. I wanted Ronan O'Gara to come out of retirement and play the last 25 minutes of that game, or, or maybe the second half of that game. Because I genu like, it needed somebody to grab a hold of it and say, we are playing in those corners, we are playing, we're going to kick down and we're going to play down there and they're going to have to play their way out of there and we're going to keep things tight and we're going to do the basics absolutely right. And, and, and by the way, I think it is worth saying, there, there are two other things that should be noted. A, Japan were excellent, outstanding is, is the word I would use, beyond excellent. Yes, there was the heat and humidity and none of us have played professional sport in 70% humidity at that level of intensity that's required, and it has to have an impact. And yes, the referee could have been questionable on a number of calls, but but they are, for me, secondary it's excuses. It's a tier two 
team against a tier one team, but that shouldn't come into again, it. Again, I'm not worried about it being a tier two team. I just think that the circumstances were the circumstances. None of those issues are, are the overriding point here because I think they need to be referenced. Mm. But wouldn't, wouldn't O'Gara, in your head, have come in and controlled that and brought a little bit more? But you don't need O'Gara when you have Johnny Sexton. Well, sorry, okay, Johnny was, yeah. Jo- you know, Johnny, Johnny would have been my second. Just, I just thought that game was made for Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like, it, it was, but I, I agree with you. It needed somebody who would take it for, for, by the scruff of the neck and go, okay, our game plan is wrong here like Mm. yes we got two tries in the first 20 minutes but we are now absolutely wrecked so we need we need to change up and we need leadership on the pitch and we need to play what's in front of us instead of playing rugby by numbers and Johnny Sexton I think if he was on the pitch would have changed it up and is he injured or is he not Shane Horgan talks about it in his piece um, one shudders to think what Johnny Sexton thought about all of this from the stands, something that I tweeted yesterday to the annoyance of a lot of rugby fans. Um, but what was Sexton doing there in the first place? The most recent updates give the impression that he was fit enough to play, but Schmidt had opted for Jack Carty to start and Joey Carberry on the bench. Really? We are getting to the stage now when bulletins on the first choice fly halves held should be treated with the same scepticism about gre- that greeted those issued by the Kremlin about ailing Russian premiers during the Cold War. Mm. So... We don't know if Johnny Sexton is injured or not, but if he's not, isn't it crazy that he wasn't on the pitch yesterday for a game that we mm. lost? Yes, it is. Because it goes on to say, this is Shane Horgan continued, a lot of hope has been pinned on Sexton and Murray being fit and firing in all cylinders in Japan. And if you think about 2018, mm. those two had a hell of a run. Oh, I mean, ultimately, those two had a hell of a run in 2018. They were the consistent. They were the best in the world. Yeah. He says, right now it looks like Sexton is failing the first part of the equation, while he says Murray who everyone was talking about in, in glowing terms after um, last week, says Murray yesterday flunked the second part. He was just too ponderous, uh, lethargy accentuated by the slickness of his opposite number. He said, if you had set a clock against the pair, that's the Japanese scrum half and Murray, for how quick they got the ball away from the rook or mall, I suspect it would have shown Murray lagging a second behind. That is a huge margin at this level. So he's looking at Sexton, Murray, Shane Horgan and saying, well, one is up in the stands. What is going on there? Yeah. Mm. I mean, really? Fair enough if we're putting them in cotton wool over the last six months, but, rest- but where are we now? And then Murray's saying, despite last week, Murray's a second behind the Japanese mm. equivalent. If you're, Schmidt looks like he wanted to put out almost his best team. Yeah, oh, his best team, I, I would yeah. agree. Yeah. So, and then I don't think he underestimated. I don't no. think Joe underestimated the challenge here. There's no complaint. I don't have a sense at any point that Ireland were complacent about this. Yeah, I, I thought actually, by the way, the, the Japanese um, coach... I thought he was a little bit unfair on Schmidt because I watched him do three or four different interviews at mm. least and every time it was like somebody who had sat down with a PR person beforehand and said, well, what am I saying here? And he kept trotting out the same line that, well, we've been thinking about this game three for a year. year. They've only been thinking about the game Six since days. Monday. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't think of a coach less deserving of that criticism. Like Joe Schmidt yeah. has probably yeah. got a lot wrong here, yeah. but there is no doubt <clears throat> that all through the summer, he's, he's watched every game Japan yeah. has played 10 times over, and it was just, this is uh, buried in Neil O'Reardon's piece with um, Joey Carberry, where he was talking about um, just preparing for Japan and Jamie Joseph's observation, the Japanese coach. And uh, funny, Carberry just um, said, or sorry, it's Carty here who says this, uh, there have been numerous occasions over the summer when we were in training, and if we um, had turnovers, Joe would say the Japanese backfield could cut us up there and move the ball out wide. So he says, we've been speaking about the Japan threats the whole way through pre-season. So yeah. this, the, like, I thought it was a, a bit disingenuous to be saying, oh, well, Joe Schmidt, they've only thought about this since yeah. Monday. But yeah. then didn't we get it really wrong? If we have been thinking about it and we then play a game where we're playing right into how Japan wants to play. Like, they've been telling us we want to keep the ball in play. Now, the stats don't bear that up as much as it felt yesterday. It felt, yeah, yeah. But for, for the key parts of the game... Oh, I never said we should feel good about the situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still bad, but I don't think you can say it was complacency. on. The no, I don't think so either. I, I, no, I think the wrong game <coughs> plan, though, I think, is, Neil is Francis, probably fair. Neil Francis is, a, has a, a, is, is right to point out to how well the Japanese played. That said, this is Neil Francis in the, in the Sunday Indo, that said, uh, they were dispatched by an uncompromisingly direct Japanese side to whom the ethos of teamwork is everything. They played at breakneck speed, relied on simple footballing intuition and were mentally agile and nimble through the 80 minutes. For Japan, there were no passengers. They were all crew. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know. I think just on the Schmidt thing, I think so 
there's one of the myths that has happened over the last few weeks is that there was a lot of experimentation during the Six Nations and preparation for the World Cup during the Six Nations. And there really wasn't. Like, Henshaw was played at fullback once. There didn't seem to be a huge amount going. Definitely there was no experimentation with players. You know, if Jack Hardy was going to be starting a World Cup match yesterday, you would think that there would be some mix up in the Six Nations of who's playing when. Mm. That didn't happen. I can't remember a huge amount of change up in, in the game plans like the amount of offloading that was happening yesterday. So that idea that Joe Smith was doing a lot of experimenting in the Six Nations is definitely something that's been, like that narrative has changed. Mm. Like we're, we're looking at back at that. He said it a few times and it's been repeated going back to what you were saying about journalists blowing in the wind a little mm. bit over the last few weeks. Like that has been repeated and I'm not sure what basis in fact that is. So I think there was some things wrong yesterday. Like Jack Hardy obviously did well in the first 20 minutes. He was playing the game plan that, that Joe had uh, wanted. But then the team were absolutely wrecked. Mm. And we knew there was humidity. We knew Japan were going to be fitter than us. So that seems like an odd that, place yeah. to be in after 20 minutes. You're 12-3 up, but you're absolutely out in your feet. Mm. And you know that Japan are not going to be. And mm. you know that the stadium is going to be with Japan. Um, I, d I don't know, I think there is a lot of questions there still for, well, for Joe. So Shane Horgan, after he talks about the Murray Sexton situation and just kind of saying, I'm not too sure what's going on here, uh, he says, Murray, in fairness, not helped by the team's tactic. So at the breakdown, uh, didn't commit many men when the Japanese um, ball carriers brought to ground. He said this was so, uh, foolhardy because too few of the Irish tackles were momentum stopping. So it played into Japan's high tempo uh, play. So in defence, not slowing down their ball and it just played into their hands. He said then, um, conversely, when Ireland had the ball, it was predictably released to one-off runners in a pod formation. Uh, none of them looked like they would have any penetration, especially against a J Japanese defence that made a point of tackling low. And he's just saying uh, the lack of guile, totally apparent. He, yeah, this was the line. He said it was either that or they'd cut the ball back between the first and second receivers. It showed all the subtlety of a schoolboy team. He said it was as easy to read as a children's picture book. Yeah, it's so damning. So damning. Of... You know, that this is the culmination of a six-year stint. Yeah, I, I, like I said at the beginning of this conversation, I, I, am, I am still struggling to come to terms with how we've woken up this morning where we are. Mm. Like, uh, there's definitely, there were definitely signs of it during the Six Nations last year. And signs of it, they, it was there for everybody to see. Yeah, and yeah. They, like, it weren't signs, they were screaming neon <laughs> <laughs> billboards that were shouting at us for, for an entire seven-week period. There's, 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 there's no question about that. But I think we, ha we have collectively, media and supporters, just had a genuine sense of belief from what we saw in 2018. But everything moves on mm. in all walks of life. And, 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 and if you're the same in 18 as you are towards the end of 19, then you're gonna get worked out and found out. And that's what happened to us yesterday. And we were lulled into a false sense of belief last week because Scotland were lamentably poor. Yeah. And and we, we walked into a left hook yeah. and got floored by it. And, and the problem is, I don't see the, psych, the psycholog, psychological damage of that left hook combined with the quality and ability of the two teams that await in the quarterfinals, presuming that we still get there. And, and the outcome feels inevitable. And that is what brings the, the yeah. sense of gloom and yeah. yuckiness to and, this and, morning. <laughs> and to go back to the Murray point, like we'd all love to see Murray playing like we know he can play. He did play very well last and week. And he played he well played, last week, but yesterday there was a huge amount of lethargy there and he was one of the ones who looked out on his feet first. The difference, like, the, sorry, but the difference between the speed of line defence from the Japanese, the, the ferocity of what was going around, on around the breakdown, that nothing was easy. Conor Murray looks good when he's given the platform to look good. Sure. He's not given the platform and he's got a, he's never, no scrum half is. They're, they're dependent on what well, is happening gonna, directly well, in front of them. Well, look at, and look he, what, was given, he was given nothing by the Japanese. Everything was scrappy or dirty or slow or it was just really, really hard. And no, but how do you explain, you know, the botch lineouts? The one in 50 minutes where they're 10 metres Sure, the they're running line. into each other of, and of Stander, Stander and, and, and Farrell. Was it Farrell? I think it yes. was Stander, Stander and Farrell. That led directly to, to their try. Yeah, and yeah. a scrum that, that, that falls yeah. apart. And Jack and Hardy kicking a restart out over the end line. So yeah. that's the bit where I think there are the mitigating circles. Now, they're kicking the ball out over the line? I'm not sure that, that I put that in this, but I, I think that's going, everything there is 50 minutes plus. Yeah, 
Am I right? I think everything there is after 50 minutes. There was some sloppiness before uh, half time though. Yeah. As well. And mistakes are going to happen, but they get amplified. And there was, I mean, in the last couple of passages of play, I would suggest to people, if you have it on, on your DVR or wherever you have it, go back and look at the last passages of play. James Ryan, to me, yeah. looks like he's out on his feet. He was. He literally had, like he was on, on empty. We're going to talk about free diving later on. Like this guy had no oxygen left in the tank. And... And I, it has to be the humidity. It has to be for me. Yeah. And and I think that's where you have to say there are mitigating circumstances without it being the overriding but excuse. But also, yeah. like part of it is that we knew that. So we we are going into it having selected a lot of the same players who played six days ago. So you know it's a six day turnaround. You know it's humidity. Like you have thirty one players there. Like that all has to come into the selection. Rory Best played eighty minutes. Yeah. Like, now doesn't that look so foolish? Imagine he had picked secondary players or, uh, you know, right. made five or six changes and they had lost. We would be sitting here saying... What was he doing? Complacent doing? Joe Schmidt did yeah. not take Japan seriously. Like, a six-day tournament. They do it in the Six Nations regularly. All the time. Yeah. I just don't... I don't buy the six-day thing. James don't, I don't either. James, James, I don't either. Yeah. Yeah. Said no. It's a World no. Cup. That's what you're preparing for. That's my point. They've been you're in preparing Portugal, for they're training that. for nine weeks. But if you... If, then you can't use the humidity thing as an excuse because you're, you know that you're training for the six-day turnaround. You know it's would humid. Would the humidity so that, have got them, though, if they had a seven-day tournament? I think it would. If, it's, if we're saying uh, it's humidity. Yeah, yeah I think... But I think I, humid... Look, I, again, I don't want to overstate on it, but we're going, you look at what's going on in Doha as well, where it's 30-something yeah. degrees, and it's not the 30-something degrees at night. It's the humidity that's... Seventy percent, yeah. The 70%. And you're watching world-class athletes at three, five, ten thousand 10,000 in marathons just stepping out because they, they, they've, and they've prepped in the same way. If it's not part of your DNA, I guess it's in, I, I'm, I'm surmising having not yeah. well, tried I'm not even or attempted talking, to, I'm not to even talking that. about four or five changes. I'm just like, look at Rory Best, 80 it, minutes. Yeah, I can't argue with that. He's 37 years yeah. old, 80 yeah. minutes, it's going to get any of us. Yes. And then coming on, like, and he showed it, like that throw, that, did, that line out, that disintegrate, like that was... Yeah. That was a tired, lazy, lethargic That's very throw. strange. That's and, a strange and that's, one. And yeah. that's what that is. Yeah. And I, he's I, still on the pitch. Why I, is he still on the pitch? He's still on the pitch because Peter O'Mahony's not there and Johnny Sexton's not there. And Schmidt wants one of those three on the pitch at all times for leadership. Got to take a short break. We're back in two seconds. We, we'll get through the rest Wrong. of the rugby. <laughs> no, we'll, 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 we'll quickly uh, get through some of the other um, pieces, sum them up, and then we'll move on. Back in one sec. This weekend, News Talk is getting behind the Irish rugby team as they continue their campaign in Japan. With thanks to Euronext Dublin, the new home of the Irish Stock Exchange. Listen up, class. Aldi's Play Rugby Sticker promotion is back. Collect official Irish rugby stickers every time you spend €30 Euro in Aldi. Fill your primary school's poster for a chance to win one of two €50,000 prizes or one of ten €10,000 prizes for your school's playing facilities. Tomorrow, Japanese for beginners. Konnichiwa, kids. Konnichiwa, sir. Aldi, official supermarket of the IRFU. Full details at aldi.ie slash play rugby. Promotion runs 10th of August to the 8th of November 2019. Tell me something hilariously horrible. Putting worms in my sister's shoes. When my granny does kisses, her beard is a bit spiky. I like worms. Stealing my nanny's teeth. Putting stinky socks in my brother's bed. David Williams' The World's Worst Children's Stories are now in McDonald's Happy Meal. Served after 10.30am except in selected restaurants in southeast of Ireland, which will serve this from 11am. A range of books available at different times, while stocks last, ends 15th of October. Over 60,000 Irish households already enjoy the protection of home insurance arranged by Bank of Ireland Insurance Services. What's more, in 2019, 9 out of every 10 customers renewed through us. Search Bank of Ireland Home Insurance and get a quote that you'll be right at home with. Bank of Ireland Group. Begin. Information accurate as of August 31st, 2019. Bank of Ireland Insurance Services Limited is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Home insurance is exclusively underwritten by RSA Insurance Ireland DAC. Underwriting requirements and terms and conditions apply. Be confident in the next car you buy. At Dundeal, you can find cars from over 1,000 trusted dealerships nationwide. Now you can search for cars with warranties and monthly finance options to meet your budget. Dundeal, Ireland's largest car showroom in the palm of your hand. That first glorious sip of the holiday as you recline into the sky. Tempting. With flights from just €499 Euro return, it's even more tempting. The Emirates sale now on. Visit emirates.com forward slash IE. Fly Emirates. Fly better. Book by October 1st, 2019. Limited availability. Terms, conditions and fair exclusions apply. 
Bruce Bedding, one of Ireland's leading bookmakers. With best odds guaranteed on UK and Irish horse racing, Bruce Betting has you covered. And with the Bruce Betting app, we're always giving you more. T's and C's apply. Bruce Betting, in-store, online, and now on your phone. Over 18s, please gamble responsibly. See dunlouis.net. Sky TV with Netflix and Sky Broadband 2. Cue comedy, superheroes and more. Cue Netflix originals galore. Cue Sky Atlantic's drama showcase and watch at your own pace. With broadband up to one gigabit lightning fast speeds to sort out all your online needs. Get Sky TV, Netflix and Sky Broadband from €59 Euro a month for 12 months. Search Sky 59 today. Available in selected fibre areas. Set up fees, T's and C's apply. Switch and save at Carphone Warehouse. Save up to €189 Euro on exclusive deals with three you won't find anywhere else. Get the Samsung Galaxy S10e or the Huawei P30 with a smartwatch GT for free. Yes, free. Both are available on a €45 Euro a month plan with three. With all-you-can-eat data, but only when you switch at Carphone Warehouse. Any network, any phone, any plan. Only Carphone Warehouse. T's and C's apply. Offer subject to availability in 24-month contract. There are used cars, and then there are Renault Selection used cars. Each one comes with a certified history check. Check. The only used car program with flexible PCP payment options, like the Renault Clio from only €29 Euro per week. Check. As well as two years warranty and roadside assistance. Check and check. Renault Selection, a new standard for used cars. Visit your local Renault dealer today. Finance is made under a higher purchase agreement. Terms and conditions apply. Deposit required. Payment is drawn monthly. Subject to lending criteria. See Renault.ie. At Electric Ireland, we're all about real commitment. Just like the Saturday sports chaperone who's battled through weather and traffic all season and driven further than a Kerry to Derry bus driver. It's why we keep giving our gas and electricity customers the 8.5% savings they get on day one, no matter how long they're with us. For real commitment, visit electricireland.ie. Electric Ireland. Smarter living. Estimated annual bill €1,736, based on average consumption, urban 24-hour, discounted unit rate, standing charge, PSO levy and carbon tax, residential dual fuel, direct debit and online billing. Terms and conditions apply. See electricireland.ie forward slash EAB. Rates as of 9th of September 2019, subject to change. Across Ireland, on 106 to 108 FM, and at newstalk.com. This is News Talk. Good afternoon. The sports minister says funding will not be restored to the FAI despite John Delaney's departure. The FAI announced last night that he has taken the decision to quit as its executive vice president. Mr Delaney had agreed in April to voluntarily step aside as CEO following a bridging loan he allegedly gave the association two years ago. Minister Shane Ross says massive reform is still needed to restore good corporate governance in the FAI. Funding will be restored. When uh, we're satisfied that the good governance has also been restored to the FAI, uh, and when we're satisfied that there has been regime change, that is not the situation at the moment. Uh, the fact that one person has left, albeit very, very fundamental to what has been happening with the FAI, is not enough. We're waiting for three reports to come out on the event. Speaking on On the Record, Sunday Times journalist Mark Tai says the FAI will fulfil certain notice and pension obligations agreed between the parties. My understanding is that the FAI, uh, this has cost the FAI somewhere north of €200,000, but under €400,000 in, in, in that kind of ballpark. And that's mainly to do with um, paying John Delaney um, in terms of his pension entitlements. And record-breaking Hurricane Lorenzo is expected to gradually track northeastwards in the direction of Ireland in the coming days. However, Met Aaron says the exact track and the severity of the system once it comes closer to land is still uncertain. Lorenzo has set a record for being the strongest ever to make it so far east in the Atlantic Ocean. Head of forecasting at Met Aaron, Evelyn Cusack, says they are working closely with other Met services to predict the track of the hurricane. It's actually intensified to a Category 5 during the night. Now, it just tipped back into a high 4. It's all to play for at this stage. Now, what's happening is that Met Air and the UK Met Office and the US National Hurricane Centre, we're holding daily conference discussions. We had one yesterday morning and we're having, we had one this morning. So the progress of Lorenzo and any potential impacts for Ireland, obviously, are being closely monitored. That's it for now. More in an hour. 
News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA, you can find our lowest car insurance price online, guaranteed. Cloudy with patchy rain and drizzle, top temperatures of 14 to 18 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Uh, welcome back. I'd like to say we found all the answers to the questions we posed there, <laughs> but just more questions. So before we leave the rugby then, to summarise what different people are saying, Neil Francis also makes the point, half-time was a seminal moment in this match and indeed the World Cup. The Japanese had dominated the second quarter of the first half. Ireland had too many static runners, not enough clarity of thought to control the game. So Schmidt, probably sensing that his team were going to struggle in the second half, changed his tactics. This was something Eddie O'Sullivan was very confused about yesterday afterwards on the TV. Uh, Jack Hardy, handy footballer and in time may mature into a good international uh, standard at half, but in the 20 minutes leading up to his eventual departure, he was all over the shop and maybe given the instructions, he was probably aware that he needed to keep the Japanese pressed in their own 22, but the quality of his kicking was poor and it gave the very dangerous Japanese back three the opportunity to run back at the Irish and keep the ball for another relentless series of fetuses. I'm quite, sir, quite sure if Johnny Sexton had been playing, says Neil Francis, that Ireland uh, would have won the game. He just does not allow that type of performance to happen around him. So that's one explanation for what happened to Ireland in the second half. Interestingly, Stephen Jones, somewhere in his piece, mm. says, and it would be an optimistic Irish man indeed who would imagine that even Johnny Sexton could have breached the red and white wall, I suppose. Neil. I don't think it's optimism. I, Johnny Sexton's on that pitch. We we win that game. Mm, not sure that we win that game, but we definitely perform differently, I think. And and I don't... I mean, I think I think it's Francis again who makes the point that, that it's typical of Joe, of Joe Schmidt's Ireland. Like, either they all play well and they all get yeah. 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10, or they all play poorly. They, they, you don't get one guy that's played well and everybody else has played poorly. Seems to be the system. In, um, this was a point, actually, Sinead, you were talking about there during the news about the Irish offloading game and how there was like a sense of adventure. Peter O'Reilly says, there is an irony here that even when Ireland were at their most successful, there was the odd descending voice suggesting Schmidt could take the team to another level if he'd only be willing to give the players <laughs> license to offload rather than just um, set up another rook. Maybe we should be careful what we wish for because he said Ireland had seven offloads, which is millions by their standards. <laughs> uh, why would you suddenly introduce risk against the one team that craves looseness, players who feast off turnovers, 13 of them by Ireland and broken play. So Schmidt afterwards was asked about this and he said, no, we didn't go out with an, an explicit idea of playing any differently from the way we normally play. The way we started the game is the way we play the game. Like that, but that's, not, that's we can not, all see not, what though. happened. Like that is not what happened. And this is part of like the Joe thing, like, you know, taking a lot of what he says with a pinch of salt, like what Shane Horgan was saying about the Cold War <laughs> analogy. Yeah. Like, that it's patently untrue. We could see what was happening in front of us is different to what Ireland Visual. usually do. Yeah. And the offload was one of the big things about that. I had a question about whether there was some experimentation that didn't happen in the Six Nations happening with South Africa in mind. You know, we can't just do... If I think if they had played boring Ireland rugby, they would have beaten Japan yesterday. If they mm. had done what they usually do, box kick, like what, box kicking... There was two box kicks in the match. There yeah. was, certainly wasn't one for... In 47 the first half. minutes. It was a yeah. long, long time before we saw it. So, obviously, it's a different game plan you had. <laughs> like, Joe, come on. Like, you know, you're Don't not. Don't lie to her. You're not, <laughs> you're not playing behind an iron curtain here, yeah. you know. So, yeah. I think. And um, the thing about the, if Sexton is there, Murray probably plays better. There was a huge difference, um, if you were watching this morning, with what Gareth Davis was doing. Sure, I, so I'm going to put it there because I don't think that Sexton makes Murray play differently. I, I genuinely don't. I think Murray plays differently depending on what's happening in front of him. What's happening at the breakdown is how Murray, it depends on how involved and how influential Conor Murray is on the game. So I don't I don't. But I think buy. everything changes if Sexton John is, is there. there. Yeah. Yeah. Got, well, yeah, your best player is going to change everything, yeah. always. Mm. It was the same when, when O'Driscoll was playing and O'Connell was playing. Those guys were missing. Ireland were a different beast. You know, it's always been. On the wider point. Yes. And I think we need to go a bit wider on this because... The navel gazing's getting to you here. Well, it's not even that the navel... Look, it's, it is what it is. And, and it's 26, 8 hours later and you're kind of going, look, we, we all know where we are and we all know... Well, we all are pretty sure of what lies ahead over the next couple of weeks. In terms of the Inevitable. tournament itself, I think Brendan Fanning does a, a nice piece in the, in the sense of world... The, the headline is World Rugby Rejoices as the underdog bites back. And it's not just in the context of... Japan beating Ireland, but it's also in the context of Uruguay beating Fiji and the context that, that as much as the, 
the tournament has and, and fairly being criticised for the gulf in class between Tier 1, Tier 2 and Tier 3 nations on some occasions since its inception. Yeah. That that gap is closing, closing, closing all the time. And, and, and having watched a lot of rugby over the last 10 days, you can see it. Like, I mean, with the exception of South Africa blowing Namibia out of the water yesterday, I think it was 57 Seven something. Three, yeah. The games have been, by and large, at least engaging and interesting, even if you, you knew there was an inevitability about a number of the, uh, or a significant number of the Even of Russia, the Japan. Right, but there'll be no, <laughs> yeah, right. Right, Russia, Japan was a decent game. Like, yeah. you know, and, and to watch and engaging and full house and different audience. And, a, and Russian a, aren't even meant to be there. Yeah, and it, but the whole thing had a, has, has, has improved, I think, as a product, is really, uh, as a tournament to watch and engage. There's no 120, 140 to nil mm. uh, um, uh, uh, games and, and that's to be, well, I, I applauded might be going a little bit too far, but it, it's, it's to be recognised. Yeah. It's to be recognised that the gap, and, and, and Brennan makes that point and goes into a bit of detail over uh, how it's developed over the last 24, 28 years. Mm. Yeah, no, it's definitely good for the game and Shane Horgan makes that point as well. Um, that, you know, as, a, as an Irish fan, he's absolutely angered by the lame defeat. But as a rugby fan, he's delighted, you know, that there is progress there, that, you know, we can't go in with this complete mathematical ability to predict every single game, like in the, in the pool stage. So yeah. it is good. It's just a pity we're on the wrong side of it. Absolutely. And we may be sitting here in four weeks' time, Joe, having won a quarter final of the World Cup and we'll all be eating humble buckets of humble pie. I'll play you back that clip in four weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> a few different people. So Stephen Jones in the Sunday Times and Mick Cleary in the Telegraph, also in the Sunday Independent, are just making the point that, well, as Mick puts it, that the cosy brotherhood in rugby has existed for too long with its uh, privileged Masonic order. So... <laughs> He's really talking about um, how the uh, protective um, pains are beginning to splinter. These teams, he's talking about tier two teams like Japan, deserve greater recognition, more days in the sun where their talent and their ardour can be displayed on the biggest stage. Uh, was this a bigger shock than 2015? He says no, because there was home advantage for Japan. They've won five of their last six games. And Brendan Fanning talks about how in the last four years they've um, had 12 games against tier one nations. Mm. But, but Stephen Jones just talking about how, frankly, the tier one nations have taken as big a slice of the pie down the years as possible, that they've you know been behind the setting up of tiers, that in from 1987 on there was talk of giving more money to the lesser teams out of the pot, and then the old nations stuck their noses in the trough, he says. They now take half the profits for themselves, the tier one nations. The upshot is that hardly any teams have emerged to challenge the old guard on the field since the World Cups began in 87. So what's the point of having them? And he goes on to say, Stephen Jones, Ireland are traditionally the most rock solid conservative union. They've been against everything forever. This morning, have they any moral right to keep um, Japan down the queue? Of course not. And just goes on to say that more money needs to be given to these nations, need to be given and um, better schedules at the World Cup. In fairness now, that's not the end of the gift of the IRFU alone. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and I, and I, I like I, I, Stephen's, uh, Stephen Jones' point is well made, and I think that discussion needs to continually be had, and actu actually actions need to be taken on it. If, if uh, I mean, I, I don't think rugby is quite as bad as cricket is as, uh, in terms of keeping developing nations out yeah. um, or growing the game in a meaningful way. Yeah. Or the um, GA and, and Minnow counties. <laughs> yeah, well, there's another... There's to make an, a bit more <laughs> Joe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but there was an element. But I do think I think that's an unfair years. comment on the IRFU for what it's is worth. It? I, yeah, I do. I, I'm. I mean, and I have a, ha, have some understanding of the way that works. The IRFU are not uh, the most conservative. Simply not the okay. most conservative. There are a number of conservative unions in that what we'll call the 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 tier the one, tier one elite. Yeah. elite. Um, and and the truth of the matter is, so there's no point hiding for it when it's about funding. It doesn't matter whether it's a rugby, cricket, soccer or Gaelic games, funding is key to development and everybody will chase as much as they can. Mm, true. So that's the rugby dealt with. Is it? Wrap it up in is a bow. <laughs> we'll tell Joe that. I mean, yeah. there's, there's <laughs> we know a, all the answers. A lot. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot. Yeah, there's and, a lot. There's a lot of, and, and, and I agree with Sinead, there's a lot of good stuff. Yeah. A lot of good stuff on the rugby. John Delaney then. So this isn't given the treatment it will have tomorrow, no doubt. Or next Sunday. Or next Sunday for sure. Uh, the Sunday Times in their main news section, as I mentioned at the very top of the show, they allude to the fact that talks were concluding between John Delaney and the FAI and that his parting, their parting would be imminent before the first report on October 7th into yeah. financial matters at the association. 
and the Sun did manage to turn things around. So on their front page, the Sun did manage to include the FAI statement. John gone, FAI confirms Delaney exit. Mark May on the front page there. So there isn't a huge amount. I mean, the, the Sunday Times, for what it's worth, did at the time yesterday write that lawyers representing both sides have been holding discussions. That could lead to his position being clarified before the publication of the first report into financial matters October 7th. The FAI Board of Management, composed of eight members, is unanimous. There's no way back for Delaney, which is no great surprise. And then, again, we're talking less than 600 words here. Uh, a golden handcuffs clause entitled them to two million for staying until 2021. They write doubling his earnings. The tr transaction does not appear in the annual accounts. The settlement figure now being considered is thought to be less than what, what was in his contract. I mean, yeah. I think it's yeah. no surprise the statement came out late. I think um, with the Sunday Times um, versus John Delaney coverage over the last yeah. um, whatever six or seven months. I think it's probably. Um, they were asking questions all week and they wanted um, answers from the FAI and they went to print at 11 p.m. And, and the statement comes out a few minutes later. So I think that's... It's a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, um, any payment, they say, to Delaney likely to be contentious, but senior FAI figures are believed to want him off the books before the reports are published. Uh, they're frustrated that the good work within the association being overshadowed by his continuing uh, controversy. And they write as well, Delaney believed to be receiving his full salary of 40,000 a month while on gardening leave as, he, as long as he cooperates with the investigation. So we don't know about the settlement. We don't know much, how much money he's received. We just know it's done. We know it's done. Um, they want him <coughs> gone. There's not much in the, in the, in the actual uh, papers today, but it is uh, worth... I think if somebody wants to, to get something that captures, it's a catch-all of, of the entire story uh, uh, in one go. Danny McDonnell uh, on the Indo website has done a really good job. I mean, I'm not, I'm not great on word counts, uh, but it's eight A4 pages <laughs> that you pr kindly uh, printed off, uh, Joe, for us. So I'm not sure uh, how many thousand words that uh, adds up to, but what it does add up to is a, is a pretty comprehensive understanding of exactly where this is under the headline um, how the cult of John Delaney somehow became a thing which I really like <laughs> as a headline yeah. um, anything jump out at you from the piece I, it's just it, what, what, what jumps out at me from the piece is all the signs all the issues that are raised one by one and, and when, you, when you put them down in one article and, 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 and chronologically well not necessarily chronologically but when you run through them as a as a collective, yeah, it's 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 staggering. Is, is the word I would use? It yeah. is staggering to read, and and it's look. I, I I think it's important to say there's two things that I, that I think are important when this story is continuing to do the rounds, and no doubt more will come out, and and, and more things will happen. There's two groups of people that you have to be conscious of in in this, and that's John Delaney's family who are going to somehow get feel the, the heat of this and a feel for them because you any individual that's brought under this kind of scrutiny their family somehow f in their own communities you've got to be aware of that and secondly the the the, the FAI employees mm. you know and I know a lot of them and worked a lot of them with them over the years and it's incredibly tough on them I feel very sorry for them under the circumstances mm. and and you have to be conscious of them but been tougher on them over the last few oh. years. A lot of them on lower pay. It's and brutal, losing and, their and, jobs. and that's referenced in here. Yeah. And I mean, it's absolutely brutal. And and it's a it's a, it's a really like I, it, it's a full stop. This uh, um, uh, press release and the end of of the Delaney era, and and there will be more paragraphs written, but it's a full stop in the story, um, as things stand today. And and uh, Danny McDonald does a really good job of yeah. of just laying it out for you and you make your own mind up on it. Yeah, and there's there's one piece of news which is, um, I think, characteristic of, of a lot of what we know now about John Delaney in that, in that piece. Um, and it says, it's understood that he would have preferred a longer, a longer departure statement than the short four paragraph effort that was low on achievements. So I think even in the, in the dying yeah. minutes of the negotiations, there was still a, a wish to be seen as an, an extremely successful CEO of the organisation, I don't even get the, with all the all the different things yeah. that have been pointed out, particularly the one around the Aviva Stadium shambles. That, as Daniel McDonald says, a shambles that would put the CEO of most businesses on a sticky wicket. So, and not on a in a negotiation with how much money we're going to leave with. It's so it's it's uh, while it's a full stop. I think there are. 
there are still a lot of Oh yeah, no, 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 I'm not saying that's it. I mean, it's just, that's the end of that chapter. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and it it, it moves on from there. Like, I, I have to go back, I don't get I don't get how the FAI, under the under the circumstances as we know them, end up releasing something at a quarter past eleven last night. Like, like it feels like that he, even now John Delaney's having to say on the way that this thing is going to be handled. Yeah. And, I, and I, that, I, I, I find that for for an association that and look, I, I, I'm careful here, but every, it, these things happen in life, for right, right or wrong, c- circumstances evolve and, and associations, businesses find themselves in circumstances that they would not have walked into uh, in a considered way and they find themselves in those. How you handle them at that point mm. is what marks you. Mm. And, and I understand that there are certain things that they cannot say and do, however frustrating the public might find that, however frustrating their own constituents might find that. I understand that. Mm. However, there are certain things that you can control and there are certain things that are red lines. And releasing that at a quarter past 11 last night is beyond my comprehension. But it was reminiscent of the Gibraltar game when they released the news he was becoming executive vice president after the game very late that night. It's doing exactly the same style. So you want to clean it up and you want to say we're drawing a line here and we're going to move on and we accept what's happened here should not have happened and we're going to do everything that we can publicly to assure you that it, that it is now being taken care of and there's some stuff we're just not going to be able to discuss. But this, you're kidding me. They, well, this merits a press conference. Without a shadow of a doubt it does. And, and at those pre- that press conference you sit and you say, look, you're going to ask me questions, Joe, that I'm simply not going to answer because there's a legal issue here and, and they're not in uh, uh, conversations that I can have in the public domain. But there are things that we can talk about in the public domain and we will do our best to answer those questions. But. But we're sitting here again in this fog of, of nonsense and, yeah. and, and it feels like this has again been orchestrated to land at a what? While all that rugby stuff is going on over there and the newspapers are out and Mark Ty and the Sunday Times are going to be over here, we'll put it in a place where we think it's going to have the least impact. I may be deeply unfair in saying that, but that's what it feels like. Well, yeah, it does, it does feel like the one side of the negotiation negotiation had this as one of their asks that mm. this goes out in a press conference a after a yeah. press statement uh, a, a press, press statement yeah, yeah uh, after new- newspapers and particularly the Sunday Times goes to print and, and, I, and again and I would have been I would have I would have said this uh, uh, in my old life <laughs> in in RTE like like when you are in when you are in receipt of public money whether you like it or not you are answerable in a way that you are not answerable if you're working for a private organisation. And the FAI are in receipt of significant amounts of public money, as are the IRFU and the GAA and, and sport in this country in general. So there is a requirement to explain certain parts. Now, I'll say, having worked for a tea, there were times I couldn't have conversations about why did that, how much, why did you do that, why didn't you, why did you pay or did you pay X? Or what did you pay for? Why? And you can't have those conversations because they're commercially sensitive conversations, and I and I respect that. But but there is a, a, a level that you have to go further than you do if you work for an organisation that isn't in receipt of them. And and I it, look, I'm but, not I'm not even, on my own in saying this out loud. Oh, we're yeah. nowhere near this. No, no, no. No. And even just with going b- past the money and the money that John Delaney was getting and the expenses and all that stuff that we've he- been hearing about, there are just questions as well. Like we were talking about the rugby there, tier two, tier tier one, like. The League of Ireland is still the problem child and no work has been done on that. There's The women, while lots has been done to grow the women's game, we're still way behind. So if you're looking at how far ahead other countries have gotten in the last 10 years on us when it comes to having a really strong women's football team, a women's football league, which obviously is, is quite far away to having any kind of strength there yeah. um, and to having young girls play. Like we have, we will continue to be a tier two team, Like, but we absolutely should have a World Cup under our belt by now and we don't. Yeah. And look how far everyone else is ahead. It, it and that's because of what has been happening. Yeah. So it's not just about personalities and cults. And sure, no, no, but I, look, I, 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 I agree with you on that, but I think there is a point where you have to draw a line in the sand and say you can't keep, like you have to learn from the past, mm-hmm. but you can't keep referencing the past for where you are at the present. Right now, now, you've got to draw a line in the sand and say, that was then, it is what it is, because there is now nothing you can do about it. Fix it as best you can and put a strategy and a structure that means we will not be having this conversation in three, five, seven years' but, time. But you see, I, I can, well, two things. One, it jumps out from Dan's piece to follow on your point that they've lost a decade here because they made such a botching of the Aviva Stadium ticket yeah. pricing. Like, uh, just a lost decade, people laid off, redundancies, 
pay cuts all the while John Delaney seemed to be getting a very good salary and expenses to boot we've been through all that so there's, there's that and then the secondary point is to follow on your point Ryle which is how do they fix it over the next three or five years the Minister for Sport the government is saying Donald Conway we would prefer if you stepped away now mm. and they have just said no we're not going to do that mm. so and then you, the statement the way this is handled I mean, it just really, doesn't feel different does yet. Any that, does any of that feel like yeah. they're doing things the right way or in a very transparent way? No, it doesn't feel like really. a full stop yet. And it should be, I agree, Ryle, it should be. But it just does not feel like it. And and we know how badly football in general is governed across the world. So yeah, sure. there's no shining light here. There's no shining example. So you could look at what they did with the OCI after Rio and, you know, that all changed very rapidly. Yeah. Like, and, and so that's a, that's a precedent we have here, but it's a much, much smaller organisation. Sure, it's more difficult. Are you, are you, oh, I, I wonder, well, is, is, sorry, there a, is there a rush here to I, get this all tied up before this report comes can I, out? Can I just back that up on that? I don't, I'm not sure that the, that, like, the principles are the same with what happened with the Olympics. And Sarah's come in and done an outstanding... Sarah Keane, yeah. Sarah Keane's yeah. come in and done an outstanding job of saying... And she's just... I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming that there's been stuff that she would love to have said out loud, but she, she couldn't. Mm. Yeah. But she has said, here's where we are. By and large, has done her best to answer the questions that she is in ability, has an ability to change. And then there has been a very clear, this is where we're going. Now, frankly, it doesn't matter whether you've got funding at 300 euro, 3,000 euro, 3 million euro, or 300 million euro. The principles are the same. Yeah, so it should be. It so could it should be a shining be. light. I think there's a lot of personnel that would get in the way rather than sure. Oh yeah, and boards and, money. and but and that's what, what I meant. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm, like, I'm not. I'm not uh, uh, um, disagreeing with you. I just I'm finding it deeply, deeply frustrating that we're still in that. I'm finding it deeply frustrating for the people that are again we referenced at the beginning, the people that work mm. there and the people who are the constituents of the, that, that want to see their sport run properly. Mm. Let's move off that for now yeah. and get through some other things. So, oh, I've taken out a break. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we've done rugby and we've done the, F the FAI. There's actually some really good pieces that we're going to finish off the paper review with in uh, just one moment. Back for the final part of the paper review. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Taking Stock with Vincent Wall. Each week, Taking Stock takes a wider view of the world of business and finance. This week, the future of the EU with Simon Cooper of the Financial Times. And we look back at the Aircom flotation 20 years ago and the legacy it left in terms of Irish attitudes to privatisation of publicly owned companies. Taking Stock with Vincent Wall. Brought to you by PwC on News Talk. Download the podcast now on the Go Loud app or wherever you get your podcasts. Satisfying Afternoons with Harvey Norman. First time buyer? Wondering how to get everything done? Don't. Just sit back and watch your house become a home with Harvey Norman's delivery and install. Go, Harvey, go! The Motorsport Show, or the S Simmons Court Dublin. A must attend event for all motorsport fans, experts, collectors, and car enthusiasts. Featuring performance cars, rally cars, drifters, Formula One simulator, live runway, and much, much more. Saturday 23rd and Sunday 24th November. Tickets from €55 Euro on sale now. Additional charges may apply. For more, see themotorsportshow.com. Proudly supported by Off The Ball. Fly Ryanair, Europe's lowest fares, lowest emissions airline, with fares from just €14.99 one way. So whatever you're after, a bit of winter sun, a ski adventure, or a fun-filled city break, you'll find the lowest fares on Ryanair.com. Ryanair. Lowest fares, lowest emissions. Limited availability. See Ryanair.com. Eamon, thanks for coming in. Look, this is never easy, but we're letting you go. There were reports you left the bathroom light on, your desk light on over lunch, and you stayed late every day last week. That's way too much electricity. With a full lighting upgrade from Energy Lighting Solutions, you can reduce your business's lighting costs by up to 80%, which means you don't have to go overboard to see your energy bills fall. Go to energia.ie forward slash business to find out more. Energia, the power behind your savings. Terms and conditions apply. Simplify how your business books and pays for taxis with Link. Link Taxis offers an all-in-one priority booking service dedicated to business in Dublin. So whether you're booking from the office, heading to the airport, or caught in a downpour, let one of our professional drivers get you there. Book online, by app, or give us a call. Choose how you pay with options to use cash, card or business account. 
Get your business moving with Link. To start booking or to learn more, visit link.ie. L-Y-N-K. Bruce Bedding, one of Ireland's leading bookmakers. With best odds guaranteed on UK and Irish horse racing, Bruce Betting has you covered. And with the Bruce Betting app, we're always giving you more. T's and C's apply. Bruce Betting, in-store, online, and now on your phone. Over 18s, please gamble responsibly. See dunlouis.net. This week at Dunn Stores, we've got amazing value on snacks you'll love. From retro favourites to snack press staples. With half price on Swizzle Sweet Chop Tub and half price across the Pringles range. Plus, with our 10 euro off every 50 grocery voucher, save even more. Dunn Stores, always better value. See in line for terms and conditions, minimum spend required. Are you fed up with diets that only give you short-term results? Do you want to lose weight and keep it off for good? Is it time for a different approach to losing weight? Motivation Weight Management Clinic's scientific approach will help you to change your whole relationship with food so you can lose weight and maintain it for life. See motivation.ie to book your private one-to-one consultation. Motivation. It's not just what you eat. It's why. Tuesday, October 8th, the Republic of Ireland take on Ukraine in a huge women's Euro 2021 qualifier. In partnership with 20 by 20, we're asking you to help the team and make history by setting a new attendance record in Tallis Stadium. Kickoff is 7.30pm and tickets are just €5, while under 16s go free. Show your stripes for the girls in green and new manager Fira Pau in her first match at Tallis Stadium. Tickets on sale now at fai.ie slash tickets. Booking fee applies. When you get a new home, or even one that's not so new anymore, it can be hard to know where to start to make it your own. Maybe with those horrific tiles in the downstairs bathroom, or that trippy carpet in the upstairs bathroom, the one the previous owners put down before you were even born. Yep, bathroom carpet. Whatever your plans, when it comes to your first home, start by talking to the Ulster Bank Mortgage Team to see how we could help. Talk to us today. Ulster Bank. Help for what matters. Over 18s and residential mortgages only. Ulster Bank Ireland DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Happy retirement, Maura. Actually, I'll be retiring next. What if I take out my pension fund in one lump sum or put it into something smart? And you're sure this horse is a winner? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or maybe I should talk to someone about this. If you're thinking about retiring, use some important financial decisions to make. So no matter who your pension is with, ask your financial broker or advisor about retirement planning with Irish Life. A smart way to make the most of what you have and fully embrace your retirement. We know Irish Life. We are Irish Life. Irish Life Assurance PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Now, welcome back. So we're reviewing the Sunday papers. We have Sinead O'Carroll and Ronald Nugent in studio. We've dealt with the rugby. We've talked about John Delaney's departure from the FAI, confirmed last night. Now a few other pieces in the paper which caught our eye. Certainly page 10, Dermot Lease in the Sunday Independent has uh, found a bit of a gem, to be honest. So Paul McCormack is a name you won't be familiar with. That is absolutely fine. Uh, Paul, Mc- Paul McCormack, like I'm sure lots of you do, uh, plays his golf at the weekend and he went out nine days ago and won the President's Prize at Port Marnock Lynx, Port Marnock Hotel and Golf Lynx, where um, he had 41 points playing off a handicap of 23. He had uh, six gross pars and a gross birdie on the 10th for a winning margin of four strokes. So I'm sure lots of you listening are saying, well, I won, that, that sounds f- I won yeah. my President's Prize. Why am I not in the paper? <laughs> that sounds fair enough, yeah. Uh, so it turns out Paul McCormick's an extraordinary story and Dermot managed to hear about it and spot it. So Paul McCormick is blind. He outscored fully sighted opponents nine days ago when he won the President's Prize off his handicap at 23. He is blind and he was blinded courtesy of being a first responder in New York City on 9-11. And that is the extraordinary story. And there's, there's just tons of brilliant things in here. And uh, Dermot has managed to sit down with him. Yeah, there's actually a whole book in this, really. But when I got to the end, I just want to know more about Paul McCormick's life. Like he, um, Dermot sits down with him and he gets a sense of, of the 9-11 story. But you also get a sense that he actually doesn't want to talk about it too much either. And mm. um, he doesn't want to get into the ins and outs of how he was blinded. He, he just says... People are dying of cancer, respir- respiratory diseases. My situation, it is what it is, and that's kind of as much of, of the detail of, of of it. But he started to go blind um, about six months to a year after um, he was a first responder. He talks a little bit about getting a phone call 
um, for for assistance from the only female NYPD officer who was killed um, in the attack. And in, obviously she's quite central to his story as well, that uh, he has her picture, um, a commemorative co coin, and that's what he used as his ball marker going around um, when he won this tournament. It's, it really is, as he said, an, an extraordinary story. But just to get into the golf of it, <laughs> I think, um, Joe, I know you play a lot of golf, but the idea of... Um, trusting your swing, he says, is a big thing for, for golfers, particularly if you get to a, a stage where you're good, you would think a lot of them can do it kind of on instinct. You can, they know exactly how they're meant to feel, how they're meant to stand. Um, but uh, Dermot talks about how there was a World Blind Championship and people like Ernie Els, Sergio Garcia, Nick Faldo, Colin Montgomery Lee, Westwood went with blindfolds and tried to hit it and they shanked it, they mishit, they, mm. they didn't get it on the green. And he related this to Paul McCormick who said, professionals like to talk about trusting their swing, but if you're standing over the ball with a blindfold on, all of a sudden the most important sense you have, an asset you take completely for granted is gone. Trust becomes a far more serious issue when you're blind. Yeah. And that's what he's built up over the last few years, he, t he took time, he used to play golf, then he took time out of it and then went back, moved back to Ireland and then after he retired mm. and started playing again, he has guides to help him play. So they're not allowed to use binoculars or anything like that. He has guides to help him play and they'll just say, you have a, a 30 footer, say 18 feet. You have to hit a 30 footer, say 18 feet and with a four foot break from the left, that kind of stuff, that that's what they're telling him. Mm. So that's how he ends up playing. I, I, it's, it's just, I think it's, like it's remarkable. Remarkable. It's, it's unbelievable. Like, it's beyond my comprehension and, and understanding as to how that actually works yeah. for you. Yeah. Like, like it's, it's a great. It's a great piece. I agree with you. Really, yeah. yeah, and it's you know it's it, for me that's that's a perfect um, a Sunday uh, read. It's really good. Nice. Yeah. There's something quite uplifting about Isn't it. Isn't there? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. uh, there was a line I, I took from it as well, because um, if you heard actually the commentary yesterday, with, there was a lot of talk about how Jack Carty played minor GA. Yeah. And as a GA person, it's nice that the GA gets a lot of credit for anybody being good at anything when they <laughs> when they turn older. I'd say he's good at rugby because of the rugby training he did. But yeah. uh, Paul McCormick said he had always been competitive back to playing with the Donegal Miners. And this was a wonderful new experience. So he, he has a Donegal yeah. Minor past. There you go. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, his family moved back from Philadelphia in '68, so he, he grew up in Bally Buffet. Did the leave insert? Couldn't get a job in the guards here because he's five foot seven. You had to be yeah. tall. <laughs> so that rule is gone now, which also I was glad to be. <laughs> That's the great things, isn't yeah. it? Well, yeah. There, you have to be tall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's so much in this. I was like, God, I'd like to talk to him more about that five foot seven thing because yeah. he went on and became a very successful NYPD cop who was in charge of 300 cops at one yeah. point. You yeah. know, and, and the guards were like, Nah, not for us. Like yeah. oh, five, <laughs> five foot seven. <laughs> Sorry, absolutely not. Uh, everything changed when the towers fell. The most vivid memory I have of 9-11, a female officer calling in for help over the radio when the first tower collapsed. It was very faint, but as a trained police officer, your ears were tuned in to stuff like that. It brings a very sick feeling, especially when it's a female officer calling for help. And as you said, that's Moira Smith, who, and she's on his ball marker now. Um, I, I'm not surprised at this comment as well. He said, we arrived at the scene. I couldn't get my bearings. The towers were no longer there. Eventually, I was confronted by a breathtaking mention of rubble. It took us a while to know what to do. There were no police guidelines for something of this magnitude. Mm. I, can you imagine the confusion? What the hell do we do? So um, it was when just... I, when uh, I first moved to New York, I lived there for a couple of years. And um, one of the embarrassing things was after a few months, you didn't want to look like a tourist. So you did use the tallest buildings to navigate east, west, north, south, because everyone that's how everyone talked there. So you really didn't want to have to turn around on a block because you'd gone the wrong way. Okay. <laughs> so you did use the tall buildings to go, right, right that, is, that is east, that is west. Sure. Um, so th that is... Uh, like on that day to just be confronted with a completely new skyline must have been absolutely baffling. Yeah. A shout out to Luke McAteer, that, he's his guide. So he, Luke tells him where to go. And he says, I don't ever ask, I want to know anything about the bunkers or the water or the out of bounds. I just want to be pointed down the middle of the fairway. <laughs> <laughs> don't we all, yeah, Paul, yeah, yeah. don't yeah, we yeah. all? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Manny a caddy has been sacked for saying, don't hit it in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're not meant to do it. Avoid that tree. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's right. amazing. It really is, well yeah. done to him. A fantastic piece, Paul McCormack lost his sight, has taken up golf, and he won his monthly, or his President's Prize rather, excuse me, at, at Port Marnock Links at the weekend, playing off a handicap of 23. Yeah. As he said though, 41 points, I'd be delighted with 41 Listen, points any day of the week. Any day of the week, <laughs> any day of the week. I've never tried to hit a golf ball blindfolded, but no. I'm gonna try at the weekend and see. I can't imagine it'll be pretty. Yeah, I can't even. No, I can't even. Uh, yeah. 
I have enough trouble hitting it with well, my Well, listen, yeah, yeah you're playing, aren't you? You started playing, haven't I you? I started playing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, fully in middle age retirement. <laughs> yeah. Gave up the camogie, started playing golf. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's someone who is playing a more adventurous sport than golf. Claire Walsh is in the Mail on Sunday. Free diving. Okay, what is free diving? We have a guide there in the top right hand corner. Uh, Claire Walsh is from Leakslip and she is a free diver. Yep, free diving is a form of diving that relies on holding one's breath until resurfacing rather than the use of a breathing apparatus. Although organised free diving has only existed as a sport since the mid 1990s, the practice has been used by pearl fishermen and spear fishermen for thousands of years. Um, so the, the sport is divided into a number of disciplines. Constant weight um, is the maximum depth following a guideline with both bifins and monfin permitted. Um, so there's different ways you can go down and there's different depths you can go down and it's all about how long you can stay down right. there for. So, so like when you're a kid, go underwater, how far can you go down, hold your breath, and that's who wins. Yeah. That's who wins. And right, and, but, but this, isn't there the kicker about what happens when you come back up? So you, you tell them what happens so, when you come so back up. So you have got, when you, when you come back up, <laughs> if you, if you, uh, I mean, I, I, like we're sniggering, but it, when you think about it's it. It's life you, or death. Yeah, if you pass out mm. in the first five seconds of resurfacing, you're disqualified. Doesn't count, yeah. Because it, you have, like you the, have not actually done it. You, no. It's like in the long jump, stepping over the line. Yeah, you've actually not saying, gone that in far. In all you can eat if you vomit within a certain period. <laughs> if you pass out, oh no, unlucky, you passed out. So she talks about like her parents come to see her recently and it was the first time they, I think they'd come to see her in a while and she passed out. And she said it's quite, quite interesting because your last memory is of being in the in water. water. And then you wake up in a bed yeah. and you're like, oh no, I passed out. So, so, so give, it, give this some context, I think, because it's it, again a bit, like, a bit like playing golf with blind. Mm. Like that's difficult for people to, to see how that might or feel how that might be for them. Like th this is, th there's a way of, of measuring this. Yeah. Like Claire Walsh can hold her breath on land for five minutes and 59 seconds. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I just want to stop and five minutes and 59 seconds, she can hold her breath. Like, and to give, what? And to give more context, when she free dives, and she's holding her breath. So she has nothing, like, it, this is not like scuba diving. You're not, this there's, is straight down. There is no cans of oxygen. There's nothing. Yeah. And she goes down 60 meters. And that is about the height of Liberty Hall in Dublin. Yeah. So that far, you are that far underwater with absolutely nothing to help you if something goes wrong with your, with your breath, whatever exercises yeah. they do to stay down there for I that That was long. insane. She's gone to a depth of 44. She's aspiring to go 70. So she's the Irish record holder of 44, wants to go 70. She's gone to 60 in training, oh, not in, in training, competition, actually. but okay. she's gone to the Liberty Hall depth in training. The yeah. deep, deepest dive in the sports history is 130 metres, set by a Russian last year. God. 130 metres. Like, she makes a really, so this is a brilliant point, and I guess it would be the thing that might freak all of us out. She said, if you're 35 metres down in the big blue with just one lung full of air, uh, the last thing you need is a negative thought in your mind. So she's talking about like the importance of staying calm. Like if you're, she says, uh, once a negative thought comes in, everything pauses, your body can shut down. You do not want to start thinking 50 meters down if you don't have enough oxygen. Like I think we've all had that horrible experience of as kids underwater at sea, you go a bit low and you're kicking to the top, you're running out of air. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So imagine a sudden bit of panic at 50 meters down I can't, like, I, this and is it's also, unbelievable. I've, I've, I, I, in, a, in a different life many years ago, I did some um, diving and, and there are two things that strike you when you go down to any sort of depth. And I, I, I can't, I don't ask me what depth I went to, but it wasn't. Eight it meters. Wasn't, yeah. <laughs> we were, we were, let's say it was, it was, it was deeper than you would go in the bath. Okay. Right. Okay. So, but there's two things. One is the darkness. The, gen the genuine darkness when you're going down and you look up and it starts to, like it is that is really disconcerting. Is it claustrophobic? Oh, absolutely. It, yeah. okay. And then the second thing is a, a, the fear of, of having height issue when you're underwater. So you can come to the side of a of a, 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 a cliff is a wrong word, but a precipice of some description and look over and you get you get thrown by the sense that you might fall. Okay. However ridiculous that might sound I, I like i think this is i think this is mind-blowing like that that yeah. she she how, how do you start out i'll tell you what i want to do today i want to dive 
with no oxygen as far down as I can and then come back out without... without well, the, one of the things that I, I just took me kind of by surprise in this is she's from Leakslip in Kildare yeah. where the sea is not anywhere close to you. The Liffey's about three feet. <laughs> <laughs> like, she's not like, you know, a, a West Kerry water baby, you know. This is a girl from... North Kildare. Yeah, it's a really, who, it's a great um, read, but Mark yeah. Allard, there's no doubt. It no, is, it's really good. It's yeah. really, really so left she, of, left yeah. of field and very interesting. She was travelling four years ago. That was how she got into it, Central South America, and uh, she saw some lads uh, snorkeling, and she was getting sick of all the gear, and uh, they told her about it, and from there she's ended up here. So. So she's ended up here after only a few years, yeah. and it's not like it's been part of her her life. From, no, no, no. From being a kid, it's it's extraordinary. It is along the lines of anything like this that I think working in a newsroom makes it really hard to want to try dangerous things. <laughs> like, and I, dangerous I, enough? Yeah, like I kind of get scared walking beside the Liffey or over bridges these days because you know everything's a danger. But like, <laughs> just wow, hats, and you've taken up golf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Hats off to people who Absolutely. you know try and. Oh. Is, you know, the body is an extraordinary, the human body is an extraordinary yeah. thing. So for people who, you know, try and push the boundaries like this is, is just incredible. Yeah, so. it's a two-page spread. It's a really good one. A bit like the Paul McCormick golfer. It's just a bit out of the ordinary. Mm. One last one just to touch on before we go then. So th there is a, still a certain resonance that uh, certain titles have, like the heavyweight champ of the world in boxing Without or the, the fastest man in the world, the 100 meters champion. It's been very easy for the last decade plus to just be like, well, it's Usain Bolt. So now we have to get used to the fact that it's gone a bit different. So Christian Coleman, Rick Broadbent, one of those writing about it in the Sunday Times, Christian Coleman won the 100 metres in Doha, the sixth fastest time in history. He's 23 years old. He's American. Uh, two things about this. One, it seems nobody watched him do it. That's Doha's problem. Mm -hmm. And two, uh, Christian Coleman has missed a drugs test this year and also twice not told them his whereabouts. And he's managed to get off a ban, which he should have got because of slight technicality. I think the tester turned up one minute outside the hour that the tester was meant to turn up on. So he was able to say, well, okay, look, even though I wasn't there, you weren't here on time, so that one doesn't count. Mm. So that is the big cloud which is hanging over Christian Coleman, and that's kind of the gist of the piece. Yeah, yeah and he cloud won hanging over athletics. Sure. Yeah, and he won he won the hundred meters, as you say, in Doha last night, and 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 it's interesting in the in the report. Um, yeah, by by Rick Broadbent, it says it says Lord Co. The IAAF uh, IAAF president says he is good for the sport. That being Coleman, but the remark is probably informed by Coleman being preferable to Justin Gatlin, the defending champion and a man with two drug bans behind him. Gatlin, now thirty seven, still did enough to get a silver medal in nine point eight nine seconds last night. A reversal of the American's position two years ago when the veteran was booed out of London by an unsympathetic crowd. Like there are two issues. One obviously is the is the is the story of of where hundred meter race running is and and has been I guess I guess all the way back to Johnson and and the doubts that have been there the whole way through uh, uh, since and then the second is for the sport to be in Doha like I watched Brennan Boyce saw the footage of him this morning coming sixth in the fifty kilometer walk overnight and and it's again we talked about the humidity earlier for the mm. for the rugby players at, at whatever it was seventy percent. These, these races are being run. The marathon and the 50k walk were starting, I think, at midnight local time. And, like, I just don't get it. I don't get why a sport... I, I understand... I get it as in I understand that the financial imperative was what, what drove the decision. Yes. Yeah. But, but I don't get it that you take your sport somewhere where where your athletes actually can't perform. And if you're talking business language, you're taking your assets. Like, yeah. <laughs> you so, have no business without, right. without your athletes. R right, and, and then secondly, so you do that, and not alone are you, are you undermining the ability of your athletes to perform, mm. or your assets, which we'll now call them, <laughs> but you're then putting it in a place where no one's showing up to watch your assets. So why is no perform? one showing up? Because the tickets haven't been sold, because there's no interest there. Like it's I think it's not just the Doha thing. There is less interest in track and field. Uh, the and thing, that's the they went to black London. Cloud. They went to London or they went to Munich or they went to Berlin or they went to Paris, that stadium would be full. They they that like again ignore the, the rights and wrongs of where the sport is at certain points that for for the sake of this argument. Mm. It's about like it, it just simply wouldn't have happened if it if it had been put in a major European city. And indeed, I don't think it'll happen when it goes to the States next time round. But this is just a uh, again, it's it's referenced in the in the article, and then then you come to the Coleman thing, and you 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 just 
you worry again about the, about about where a sport is and and its ability to attract in a, a a caliber of athlete that wants to put themselves in a position where they're thinking, what's the point? I do wonder how for how many years that there will be full stadiums in. European cities and American cities. Like there's certainly like Rio was a different example for the last Olympics, but there was no full stadium for track and field. Yes, no, no, um, even that. for the hundred meters, and obviously that was different because it was harder. Um, for, you know, in a developing city like Rio to get full stadiums. But I think there's just a huge amount of lack of ability to suspend that disbelief even for ten seconds. You know, the whereabouts forms are important for a reason. Mm. So if someone is just flagrantly not doing them three times in eleven months and gets off on a technicality, like. It is nine seconds, but it means buying a ticket, it means getting on a bus, it means getting to the stadium, and then really, do do we even... The aftertaste. Yeah, it's not... It, the the 10,000 metre women's race in, in the Olympics, it was an extraordinary feat of the human body, um, what she did. She you know, broke that Chinese record by dec 10, 12 seconds. Like, no one believed it. There was no excitement in the crowd. The Chinese record, the one back in Sonia's day? Yeah. The 10,000 metre was broken by the Ethiopian runner. Um, I won't remember her name now, but... Maybe don't mention it. Um, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I think, well, you know, look, it has to be said early, it is the, it is the issue across all sport. I mean, the one, thing, yeah, the, the one thing that you're going to say is that if there is a positive, that it's out there for athletics and it's out there for cycling and it's out there in, in one or two other sports and it probably isn't out there nearly enough in... No, in, in other sports, particularly in team sports. It's true. And, and because of what people have seen in cycling athletics, a lot of bodies don't want it to be outed. And we don't want to be sitting here talking all the time about drugs. Yeah, but it, we don't. And, and, and I don't think, I don't think we, we should add that every conversation mm. has to be framed in it. But I think every conversation should be framed in the fact that it is there. That it's, and there's no point pretending otherwise. And, and it is incumbent on us all and, and on, the, on the governing bodies to try and, and grab a hold of it. Because, the, because what, what you hate to see is our sports that are, are, tr are grappling with it, whether they're doing that successfully or, or, or whether they're doing it appropriately. I'm not in a position to, uh, to give a view. But what you would hate to see is when they're de trying to deal with it, that the sport plummets off the edge of, of, of into, a, yeah, yeah. into obscurity where those that don't deal with it turn a blind eye to it or just blatantly igno ignore it, the interesting prosper. And that, that yeah, doesn't encourage yeah, yeah. people, right? No, it's true. The interesting yeah. model is the NFL one where they're just like, this guy's out because of a hamstring tear, this guy was done for testosterone, and this guy... Uh, a domestic abuse. Um, yeah. And this guy was done for abuse. domestic yeah. abuse, and we'll, we'll should, just should kill you back in four matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's just... That's a different level. Yeah. Um, interestingly, though, just a quick mention, I, I hadn't realised, um, with a view to the World Cup, so one of the reasons the marathon and the 50k walk is so contentious is that they have to obviously go outside of the stadium, mm. where it's like 30 gazillion degrees and 80% mm. humidity. So within the stadium now, the air conditioning works. So it's a it's a balmy twenty three to twenty five degrees yeah. controlled at all times. Because yeah. I thought with the World Cup coming there, that the air conditioning wasn't going to work in the stadium. So it now seems like it does. It, it will work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but they they still have to go outside at some point. I'm oh, still sure, going to yeah, be surprised yeah. if if every single professional footballer out there makes himself available for the World for Cup. The World Cup. Really? Uh, going back to like their body being their asset. Like I don't know if a lot of people will put their themselves at risk at risk in that way. I might be, the be wrong, Zika but virus. I would, There'll be a Zika virus. Yeah, I, it's something like that. I just do think that there's a lot of people who will be looking at their contracts and thinking, I'm in this for a lot longer than, you know, a quarterfinal in the World Cup. Um, Semi-final. <laughs> 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 uh, shout out to, uh, we were, had a, Thomas Barr was unlucky yesterday. Yes, um, well worth mentioning. A mistake at the, at the final hurdle probably cost him, and you could see that he, uh, he just didn't, it wasn't, quite on his technique and just l missed out um, on, on making the last eight. So that was a pity. He is a championship runner, so I think he would have been hoping to be in that final eight. Yeah. We are pretty much done. I can see you, Ryle, scrambling for something. I'm scrambling for something because I, I think it was just referenced and it's uh, it's a Mick Clifford piece around the... Remember the whole Jason Sherlock has fallen out with Jim Gavin piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm struggling for it and seems there might have been... Ah, I can't find it. I don't know where it's gone. It's down the bottom of one of the pages. Yeah, there it is. Oh yeah, Sherlock admits split story had some substance. 
Almost as if a pressure valve has been released, there has been a refreshing honesty and candour in the interaction between the Dublin players and management with the media over the past few weeks. The latest was Jason Sherlock's admission that the story last February that he had left his role as the coach of the Dublin panel as a result of strained relations, in quotation marks, was not, not entirely groundless. And it goes on to explain why. But it's, it's funny, isn't it, how something makes all this noise in, in February yeah. and then it's a footnote in September. And it's that like, actually it's true. It was, it was a bit of... <laughs> and they're almost saying the story getting out brought things to a head and yeah. not forced to yeah. chat. Are we together or not? It's just, it was, it's worth, it, it's just worth a little read from McClifford. Yeah. That is a stun. There's loads more in the papers, as you might imagine. Sinead O'Carroll, incoming editor at The Journal. Ryle Nugent, commentator, former group head of sport at RTE. Guys, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a short break. Busy hour coming up. Back in a sec. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Listen up, class. Aldi's Play Rugby Sticker promotion is back. Collect official Irish rugby stickers every time you spend €30 Euro in Aldi. Fill your primary school's poster for a chance to win one of two €50,000 prizes or 